Hello there, Zach Murphy here, and I have a new teaching here for you today in my series um, in the book of Acts. I want to cover verses 8 to 28, which will complete Acts chapter 14 for us in this series that I'm doing. And um, in this teaching, we're going to take a look at some different issues and how it applies to us today. Um, in my next teaching with the book of Acts, I'll probably go into chapter 15, and I'm probably going to see a bit of transitions in there within the book of Acts, because there are some transitions that do take place within the book of Acts. So we're going to look in those in a little bit more depth. So be sure to hit the, the excuse me, the subscribe button down below, and hit the bell icon beside so you can get notifications also. So before we get into the word, I want to pray real quick, and then we'll get into what I have prepared for this teaching. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time here, Lord, and for the ability for me to record a video to share your word through social media, Lord. I thank you, Lord, for those that are watching and listening to this teaching, Lord, and give them ears to understand, Lord, and reveal truth to them as they are listening to this, Lord, and give them a hunger for your word, Lord. And we thank you for us. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. So I want to start with Acts chapter 14 and verse 8. Um, so one thing to keep in mind is that if you watch my previous teaching in the book of Acts, the apostles Paul and Barnabas ended up in um, um, Lystra. Not sure if I'm pronouncing that correctly. Um, so that's what we're going to see here as we begin in verse 8. So, we'll wait for that clock to stop. I always get perfect timing. Alright, now that that clock stopped, we'll start here in verse 8 again. This is Acts chapter 14. And it tells us, In Lystra, a certain man without strength in his feet was sitting, a cripple from his mother's womb, whom had never walked. This man heard Paul speaking, Paul observing him intently and seeing that he had faith to be healed and said to, excuse me, and said with a loud voice, stand up straight on your feet. And he leaped and walked. Okay, so this is talking about there in Lystra and there is a lame man here. He has been lame since um, he was born. Um, so this was something from childhood, um, birth defect you could call it. And he was healed through the power of Jesus Christ, um, and God used Paul to perform the healing. Um, and then we're going to see something interesting kind of take place here in verses 11 through 13. But just keep in mind here that this is a miracle that takes place. And often we see miracles in the New Testament. If you followed my other teachings, we saw a lot of people... Um, accepted the gospel when miracles took place. But we're going to see something a little unusual here from what we've seen, especially if you followed my previous teachings. And one thing to keep in mind is that miracles and all the signs and everything, and when we read these in the Bible, they are signs to unbelievers. Um, and it's often the signs and even our testimonies that will make an unbeliever want to know the gospel and most likely and pray that they will accept the gospel. So going on to verse 11 here, it tells us, Now when the people saw what Paul had done, they raised their voices saying, Lyconian, in a Lyconian language, the gods have come down to us in likeness of men. And Barnabas they called Zeus and Paul they called Herms because he was the chief speaker. Then the priest of Zeus, who the, whose temple was in front of their city, brought oxen and garlands to the gate, intending to sacrifice with the multitudes. Um, so this is something very interesting here. Um, you see that these people in the area where this miracle took place, they mistaken Barnabas and Paul is false gods. And this is because of some cultural things going along in this area. Um, there was some folklore roots. And you can look more into this. Um, there's a lot of great articles with 
the history of this stuff that took place with these false gods. Um, and, you know, this is just idolatry. And one thing I would compare this to, they were worshipping Paul and Barnabas as they were their false gods that they worshipped in this area. And one thing I want to point out here, you know, something I see in the church world today is that, you know, we have these healing services and some people will go to those and they might get genuinely healed. And pay attention, I'm saying genuinely healed because, you know, a lot of stuff you see on TV, sadly, there's a good chunk of it that is not genuine. Um, so, you know, that's why I always say this is a call for discernment, especially in this time we're living in. Um, but, you know, people go to these healing things and maybe they do get genuinely healed. And some people say, oh, this pastor, this minister healed me. Well, that's incorrect. It's through Jesus Christ that you were healed. Yeah, God used an individual as a vessel for that to pray over you. But, you know, we have to realize when that happens, it is a work of God, not of man. And, you know, we cannot look at the ministers in these healing ministries and, you know, even just general ministries, ones that maybe don't flow with healing ministries, but, you know, just in general, that um, we cannot look at these people as above God. You know, some people do. I see that a lot. Some people look at people in the ministry field as that they're above God and they put them on a pedestal. That is completely wrong. I've seen many people do that, putting their pastors or evangelists or whoever like on a pedestal and almost like looking to them like they're a God. And that's something that really we should steer away from as Christians. So that's something I want to point out here because as I was preparing this teaching, that's why I thought because I've seen some of that in different churches I've gone to and different events I've gone to also. You know, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with going to different services and everything, but you know, we have to be mindful of how we view people and not to view them higher than the God that we serve. Um, because, you know, if we do that, then it is idolatry. Um, that's something that we definitely want to stay away from. Um, going on to verse... 14, we'll go to verse 18, it tells us, But when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard this, they tore their clothes and ran in among the multitude, crying out, saying, Men, why are you doing these things? We also are men with the same nature as you, and preach to you that you should turn from these useless things. And I want to point out here, um, in the King James Version, I'm reading from the New King James Version, um, it actually uses the word vanity. So just something to point out. Um, so they're asking them to turn away from these useless things to the living God, who made the heaven, the earth, the sea, and all the things that are in them, who in bygone generation allowed all nations to walk in their own ways. Nevertheless, he did not leave himself without witness in that he did good, gave us rain from heaven and fruitful seasons, filling our hearts with food and gladness. And with these sayings, they could scarcely restrain the multitudes from sacrificing to them. So right here we see a few things here. Paul and Barnabas, they speak up about this. They do not tolerate this idolatry. And they're, I can imagine they're a bit frustrated that these people in this area mistaken them for false gods. And they realize, wow, there is a problem in this area. These people worship false gods. And they address that. And, you know, anytime we see a problem, whether it's in our church or, you know, even in our own families, whether if we see a problem that the Bible defines as wrong, we should not approach necessarily with full anger, but we need to approach it with truth and what Scripture says. Because, um, you know, one of the best ways to do spiritual warfare is approach it with the truth that is found in the Word. Um, and so, Paul and Barnabas tell them they need to get away from this useless... Um, worship of these false gods and turn over to the one and the only true living God. And this brought to my mind Romans chapter 1 verse 17 and I honestly think that this should be read to every church. 
And if you would read the scripture to every church and preach on how it applies to us today, you would have many people's um, religious hairs curled. Um, I shouldn't say religious hairs curled, I would say worldly hairs curled. Um, so go with me to Romans chapter 1, um, starting at verse 17 to verse 32, and this is a bit long, but I think this is something that needs to be addressed because it kind of ties in with this. So it tells us, For in the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness because what may be known of God is manifest in them. God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen. Okay, so you know things are evident through creation that there is a creator and he is the one and only God. Being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse, because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were they thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and in their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools, and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into the image made like corruptible man, and birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. Therefore God also gave them up to uncleanliness in their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves, who exchanged the truth of God for the lie and worshipped and served the creature rather than the Creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason, God gave them up to vile passions, for even their women exchanged the natural use for what is against the nature. Likewise, men also, excuse me, likewise also the men leaving the natural use of the woman burns in their lust for one another, men with men committing what is shameful and receiving in themselves the penalty of their error which was due. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them up to a debased mind or a reprobate mind to do those things which are not fitting, being filled with all unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil-mindedness. They are all whisperers, backsliders, haters of God, violent, proud boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful, who knowing the righteous judgment of God that those who practice such things are deserving of death. And not only do the same, but also approve of those who practice them. Alright, so a lot said here. Um, one thing I want to point out is in verse 28 when it says God gives these type of people that are living in unrighteousness and even approve of other people's unrighteousness. Um, he gives them up to a debased mind or a reprobate mind. Um, if you look up a, what the word reprobate means, is an unprincipled person. And I don't know anyone who is a Christian who would want to be an unprincipled person. Some synonyms for the word, just looking it up on Google. Um, troublemaker. Um, rascal. Um, wrongdoer. Evildoer. Sinner, it even uses. Um, you know... One thing I want to point out here, what many Christians don't realize, that, you know, they might be going to a church where they preach salvation, they might have accepted Jesus as their Savior, but, you know, they support people and they approve people that are homosexuals, or approve people who um, do any other type of sin, not just homosexuality, but I really want to hit on homosexuality here because, you know, I see so many more and more churches are coming out supporting homosexuality. Um, 
You know, you cannot be Christian and support homosexuality. I'm not saying that you should show hate towards someone that is part of the LGBTQ whatever movement. But we have to identify it as sin. You know, yeah, it might offend people, but so what? You know, the Word of God was not meant to be, you know, a fairy tale and a happy ending thing. You know, it's going to offend people. The Word of Truth is going to offend people, and it's going to offend sinners especially. And, you know, it will even offend believers. As we read, we're like, wow, I need to correct this in my life. But, you know, it tells us in verse 32 that um, it tells us that those who practice these such things are deserving of death. And not only those people, those who approve of those. So, you know, one thing I want to point out here, you know, you, you can't be a Christian and support homosexuality. Yeah, you should um, show all people the love of God every day. But, you know, we cannot support these sinful movements that are taking place in our world. We cannot support them. Yeah, we still show the love of God to people. I definitely want to urge that. We should not be hateful. But we have to call sin, sin for what it is. Um, I want to say something else here people won't like. You cannot be a Christian and go to a same-sex wedding. Otherwise, you're fitting into here at those who are approving of those things, and you are just as deserving of death. You know, we have to stand firm as Christians. We have to stand firm no matter what. And you know what? It might mean that people that are our friends will distance themselves from us. All right, sorry about that. The clock was going off for the 6 o'clock mark. Um, but, you know, we have to be careful for what we stand for. And, you know, when you read the Word of God, it makes very clear, you know, there is no guesswork when it comes to the Word of God. It is very clear for what it stands for. It's something I really want to urge very strongly. I know some people watching this are not going to like this, but... You know, we have to be careful. Even more talks about murder here. You know, we can't be supporting abortion or any other type of murder, first or second degree. You know, abortion is murder, plain out. Um, just another issue. I see even Christians that I see post things on social media. They're supposedly Christians, um, but they are supporting abortion. They even say that they support abortion. Um I say they're supposedly Christians because I don't know how you could be Christian and support abortion or even a candidate that supports abortion. It's, I don't see it possible. I'm sorry. Well, I'm not sorry, but it is what it is. Evil mindness, um, people that are proud and boasters, you know, we cannot even make ourselves idols. We have to be very careful at self pride, you know, we should not be making ourselves idols of ourselves. Um, you know, that's something I see many people do that are involved in athletics and other stuff. That's something we have to be very careful about to really learn to humble ourselves as Christians. Um, and undiscerning, um, I think that's something that speaks for the whole church. We need discernment today. We need God to, we need to ask God to give us the gift of discernment. And, you know, I think that is one of the best gifts God can give you is the gift of discernment and for you to walk in that gift because, you know, it's so much needed today with the garbage that is out there. Um, and, you know, I'm just giving a few examples um, other than the homosexuality and abortion. But, you know, all of these, we can see how the church is lacking just in these today. Um, and just something I want to point out here, because, you know, we have many examples to go off here in the Bible to help us in the church today. And that's kind of why I'm doing the study on the book of Acts, because there is transitions in the book of Acts, but there is it's also a bit of a template, too, for how the church should be today. And some examples for us to look at, both with issues and also for how we ought to be as Christians. So going on, I want to continue on to verses 19 and 20, which tell us, Then Jews from Antioch and Iconium 
came there, and having persuaded the multitudes, they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, supposing him to be dead. However, when the disciples gathered around him, he rose up and went into the city, and the next day departed with Barnabas to Debris, or Derby. Not sure if I'm saying that last one correctly. So right here, these unbelieving Jews come to the area, and they stone Paul, and they suppose him to be dead from that, but he isn't, and he recovers. But, you know, one thing that I find inspiring here is that the apostles still continued on. You know, they could have been like, oh, we don't want to do this, you know, Paul got stoned over this, we don't want to risk our lives and whatnot for this. But you know what, they still continued on, you know what, we have to do the same. You know, this type of per persecution might not come towards us, but you know, like I said earlier, we might have, um, as we minister the gospel to people and are firm for what we stand for, you know, our friends and even some of our family members might distance themselves from us because of what we stand for. You know, sometimes they can't handle the truth, and you know, as it says in John, um, darkness doesn't like associating with the light. Um... So just something to keep in mind here, you know, if these apostles can handle persecution, then why can't we? Why can't we pick up our own cross? Um, I think that's something that the church lacks. You know, I see many Christians who do not want to stand bold. Um, and they're like, oh, well, maybe my family might distance themselves from me or certain friends. Well, you know what? So what? You know, we need to focus on our eternity. That is one thing we need to focus on as Christians. Alright, sorry about that, I just had to pause the video again because of some sound going off from a clock behind me. Uh, I picked the best time to do this. But um, continuing on, as I said, we have to be bold. Um, and you know, one thing I can attest for, you know, because of what I stand for biblically, some of my cousins in my family don't even associate with me. I haven't spoke to them probably for... I'd say at least 10 years, maybe. No, not 10 years, it's less than that, but maybe 8 years, roughly. I'm not sure exactly how long it's been to this day, but, you know, it can be challenging, but, you know, it's something that is a part of it. You know, there will be tribulation that comes our way and things we don't like because of what we stand for, and people might treat us differently because they don't like what we stand for. And we just have to learn to push through it and lean on God for strength. And, you know, we have to focus on eternity because, you know, it doesn't matter, honestly, all these things that take place in the world to us. Yeah, you might have sickness or whatever, but, you know, we have to keep pressing on, focus on eternity because, you know, all that matters is when we, when we pass away from this earth or, you know, the rapture happens, what we should really focus on is hearing the words well done my good and faithful servant we really need to focus on that rather than focusing on the things of this world and you know the circumstances that might happen to us and certainly pray as we go through different tribulations in life and different trials but you know just always keep that in mind of eternity and one thing i like to think of you know when sometimes things aren't going so good is what is the worst thing that can happen to you on this earth if you know that you will have eternal life when you die. You know, honestly, there is nothing bad in this world that can happen to you if you will, if you know truly that you will have eternal life. Um, because, you know, that is one of the things that matters the most. So just one thing I want to point out here as we're going through this, because, you know, the apostles here are setting an example. They keep, they keep on going with their ministry no matter what opposition they're facing. So going on verses 21 to 23, it tells us, and when they had preached the gospel to that city, they made many disciples and returned to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch, Antioch excuse me, strengthening the souls of the disciples, exhorting them to continue in the faith, saying, we must through many tribulations enter the kingdom of God. Okay, so right here, we're going to go through tribulations, Christians. This isn't an easy walk. Verse 23, So when they had appointed elders in every church and prayed with fasting, 
they commended them to the Lord in whom they had believed. So right here we see many disciples were added and you know elders are assigned to the churches and they did some praying and fasting here. But one thing I want to point out here is that we will face tribulation. This is not an easy walk as a Christian. Um, you got to pick up your own cross. This is not an easy walk if you're truly going to do it. Um, you know, if you're a Christian, you're not facing any opposition, and you haven't faced any opposition for years, um, are you really doing the walk out of question? Or, you know, are you really stepping up to the plane and standing for truth? Um, because, you know, the Christian walk is not going to be your best life now. I know some people are going to hate me saying it's not your best life now. Um, if your best life is now, if that's your mindset, then I would question where you're going to end up in eternity. Um, this isn't an easy walk. We have to lean on God for our strength and everything. Um, that's one thing I want to point out. Um, but continuing on with verse um, 24, it tells us, And after they had passed through Pisidia, they came to Pamphylia. Now when they had preached the word in Perga, they went down to Attila. Not sure if I'm pronouncing these right. From there, they sailed to Antioch, where they had been commended to the grace of God to work, which they had completed. Now when they had come and gathered the church together, they reported all that God had done with them, and that he had opened the door for, excuse me, opened the door of faith to the Gentiles. So they stayed there a long time with the disciples. So we see that they travel in different areas and they shared the testimony of how God was working through their ministry. And you know, that's an example of how um, missionaries will work when they go to different churches and share what's going on. They'll share what God has done in their ministry. And you know, that's an example we see here. And you know, as you're a Christian, whether or not you're in the five-fold ministry or not, um... When you're witnessing to people, you shouldn't be sharing how much God has done for you, how he's been faithful, because often it is that that will um, bring unbelievers to accept the gospel. Um, and not just sharing that with unbelievers, but sharing your testimony with other believers also, because it will um, edify the body of Christ. So just something very important to keep in mind here. Um, we see many examples here on um, ministering to people. We need to share a testimony here. And just pressing on regardless of the opposition and tribulation that we face. And the other point here was dealing with um, unrighteousness and addressing it. We have to stand for the truth very firmly, but at the same time show the love of God towards people. And, you know, one of the ways to show the love of God towards people is through, you know, the fruits of the Spirit, kindness and everything. But also just wanting to um, genuinely share with them the truth. And genuinely share that you care about their eternity. Um, that's we have to keep that in mind as we're witnessing the people. You know, we will deal with people that are living a sinful life, so we have to keep that in mind and address that issue with the truth that is in the Word of God. Um, so that's all I have for you in this teaching. Um, my next few videos coming up from this one, I'll probably be doing one in my series on the Gospel of John, starting with chapter 3, I believe. And I'm also going to make a video on how to put every thought in the captivity of Jesus Christ. Um, that was something many people asked me. I got a few Q&A responses um, through email and other people talking to me. They really wanted a video on that. And if you were following my videos earlier, I made a video on dealing with anxiety. So I think that can kind of tie together with that one. So I will be making that one eventually as I get that teaching together and um, seek God on what he wants me to speak on regarding that. Um, so definitely be sure to hit the subscribe button um, so you can continue getting my videos here. Um, check out the links in the description part below because I do have links to my website below and also my Instagram channel and my Facebook channel. I do post regularly on those, so definitely check those out. And there are some resources on my website also and additional um, study guides for you for my series on the Gospel of John. I always do post um, 
an outline for those, and I will probably be posting an updated outline for my series on the Book of Acts. I kind of did neglect keeping one up to date for that, but I probably will get caught up eventually and do that. So that is all I have for this teaching. Um, and I'm going to pray here real quick. I haven't gotten any new prayer requests. I do have a few people I'm continuing to lift up in prayer that are dealing with cancer and other sickness. So I'm just going to cover all sickness right now um, in this prayer because um, you know I know people are dealing with different chronic illnesses and you know the flu and all that's going around at the same time so I'm just going to cover all that um, in this short prayer here and that'll be the end of this teaching. So dear Heavenly Father I thank you for this time here Lord and for me to share your word through this video here Lord and Lord I ask you to meet the needs of those who are watching and listening to this teaching Lord whatever it is that they're going through Lord and Lord, the people right now that are dealing with sickness and cancer, Lord, I come against that in the name of Jesus, Lord. I call them healed. In the name of Jesus, Lord, let your will be done. In the name of Jesus, we thank you for it. And Lord, I ask you to give them strength, Lord, and reveal yourself to them in a new way, Lord. And for everyone who has um, listened to this teaching, Lord, and watched this, Lord, I ask that you give them understanding as you read their word as they read your word, excuse me, and reveal to them truth in your word, Lord, and give them revelation knowledge, fresh revelation knowledge, and give them more of a hunger for you, Lord. And we thank you for this in Jesus' mighty name, amen. So thank you for watching. God bless you, and be sure to hit the subscribe button down below. And be sure to share this video with your friends and family. Thank you, and God bless.